you know, the concept of why you might get burned with what you're currently doing. So this is a 35 year old female with patellofemoral pain uh, and severe instability. This is her exam in the clinic here. Um, so I unfortunately was not able to get her MRI. The PAC system has been down from this system for the whole weekend and today. You can see she had pretty significant instability um, and that's not her only problem. So we, uh, we also got distal femoral alignment. So you know, any patella femoral instability before I go get an MRI, we're getting this alignment x-ray because uh, we all know patella instability is very dependent on kind of full lower extremity uh, alignment. And here she's in valgus, which is another uh, risk factor for patella instability. On her x-ray here, she's already subluxed. She has mild uh, trochlear dysplasia and starting to show some arthri arthritic changes uh, in the patellofemoral joint. And then I wanted to show you on her MRI, she's got full thickness chondral lesions and, and thickness defects along the uh, lateral facet um, is in some areas along the medial facet. So here we are a patient who's got uh, pretty significant osteoarthritis. She's got, uh, she's in valgus and she has patellar instability. So she's 35 years old. I mean, this is like the worst case you possibly can think of. We talked about um, doing um, trochlear plasty with grafting, osteochondral allograft grafting. We talked about alignment and we talked about total knee, which would correct the alignment and her patellofemoral problem um, versus uh, isolated distal femoral osteotomy and patellofemoral uh, replacement. Given that she was 35, um, you know, she went ahead and I'm just curious, Rob, what do you think? What are you going to do for him? Oh, he's driving. Okay. So, uh, um, this, so for this person, she elected to go, uh, for a patellofemoral replacement and just a femoral osteotomy. So this is her, uh, two week appointment. Um, we have the, this distal femoral plate with this wedge in here. Um, you know, I used to put these wedges, uh, and now I've actually weaned out of doing them because the um, graft is so resilient. Actually, these take longer to resolve than, uh, the, than the graft itself and makes it look like a much better x-ray when you just use the nanobone. So this is our two-week x-ray. We can see the osteotomy. Uh, we have great correction. This is just uh, four weeks later. I can see tremendous amount of, I mean, you would never see that in a bone chip. Like you're gonna see all this resorption and you actually see, you know, lucency. Um, and then uh, this is at uh, this is at three months, and it's basically completely healed. Um, and just the area where that wedge is, it still has yet to heal, and it kind of sits there. But functionally, it's totally healed. I mean, this is her. This is her at the six-week appointment uh, when I'm about to get her to start weight bearing, um, and she already has you know this much range of motion, normal patellar stability, um, you know. And then I ask her to go up here and ask her, "How's your pain? How are you pain?" No pain at all. So, I mean, this, uh, it, they, these heal much faster, much less pain, because um, I think they provide a little bit more earlier stability than uh, they may see in some of the other bone substitutes. Uh, so uh, on a DFO, how, how much are you typically using? That size was uh, 10. 10, okay, is that pretty standard that, for you? Five, you probably get away with, depending on cost. Uh, yeah. Like a bigger correction, so 10. On a five degree correction, it's usually five cc's. Um, and then, so, but, but on my PAOs, the bigger, you know, the 10 all the time. So, so can you talk about just, you know, the, the feel of the, the nanobone and what you're, because again, one of the concerns with using, you know, putties and other solutions of grafting is when you're going into a big cavern like a DFO and you got this big open space, you worry about extravasating outside of where it needs to be. Is it pretty malleable, going to stay where you want it to be? Is there any, you know, any thought to, you know, I guess other considerations for that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the recommended, you know, this is made by another company that starts with A, uh, RT, and uh, they, um, but in their, their recommendations, they use this, you know, calcium cement to inject in there. That stuff runs everywhere, starts running out the back of the knee, and then you get this x-ray with this little twiggle of calcium phosphate running out the back of the knee. This stuff, you put it there, it doesn't move. You don't need to wait for it to get hardened. It's as hard as it's going to be as you put it in. Um, and so you can, you can impact it as much as you want. It makes a great seal on the periosteum. You can just basically take your freer or your finger and just once you've filled up the whole defect, just bring your finger like caulk and just rub it right over and you actually barely can see it. It looks totally like bone. Um, and you can then irrigate on top of it. You don't have to worry about it, you know, an assist or a residence doing bulb irrigation and it all going away. Uh, it's very resilient. 
I think that's a great point about the ability to irrigate afterwards because I know that's been, you know, problems with other products in the past or if they weren't hardened, you run the risk of, of losing that. Do you ever mix that with Cancellus chips or you kind of just let it go? I don't. I mean, I don't think that, uh, I mean, my, exper my experience, it heals so fast. I'm not using any algorithms. I mean, that's one of the beauties of this thing is that there's no graph tracing, right? So you can be a purely... 100% autograph with no graph tracing that's going to help your surgery center, it's going to help your, your operating room because they don't have to track this graph and where it went. It's right off the shelf, no refrigeration needed, easy storage. I mean, you guys have great easy um, kind of options in terms of kind of how to get it and what forms it, has, it comes in. Yeah, There's also I, more liquid phase that, uh, you know, potentially could, we, we're looking at, you know, maybe coming out that you can inject this kind of thing that's still being investigated. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're just trying to find different ways to use it. Um, and it's just very resilient. It's, it, right now, the putty is the best in my hands. Yeah, I, I think the ease of use is something you can't underestimate, especially with these cases when they're, they're fast moving. You don't want to be waiting for a product to thaw or a product to be, you know, mixed or whatever, or to set for that matter. Uh, and then, you know, in my hands, at least in a community hospital, Gil's going to talk about trauma next. But if I'm doing my fracture work at night, you don't want the, you know, the, the scrub tech who only scrubs OBGYN saying, I, I don't know how to mix this. I don't know where it's at. So that's one of the nice things about that. So Gil, why, why don't you go ahead and talk about some of your experiences? Yeah. Let me, uh, let me share my screen. Why don't we get into my talk? Was that, is that good? And then we'll go. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah. 